Hi there. Welcome again to Library at Home with Miss Carolyn from the Town Hall Library. Today we are starting with Chapter 7 of Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 7, A Mad Tea Party. There was a table set out under a tree in front of the house, and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A Dormouse was sitting between them fast asleep. The table was a large one, but the three were all crowded together at one corner of it. No room, no room, they cried out when they saw Alice coming. There's plenty of room, said Alice indignantly, and she sat down in a large armchair at one end of the table. The Hatter opened his eyes very wide on hearing this, but all he said was, Why is a raven like a writing desk? Ooh, I'm glad they've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that, she added out loud. Do you mean that you think you can find out the answer to it? said the March Hare. Exactly so, said Alice. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. Well, I do, Alice hastily replied. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. You might just as well say, added the Dormouse, which seemed to be talking in its sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. Oh, it's the same thing with you, said the Hatter, and he poured a little hot tea upon its nose. The Dormouse shook its head impatiently and said, without opening its eyes, Of course, of course, just what I was going to remark to myself. Have you guessed the riddle yet? the Hatter said, turning to Alice again. No, I give it up, Alice replied. What's the answer? Well, I haven't the slightest idea, said the Hatter. Nor I, said the March Hare. <sighs> Alice gave a weary sigh. I think you might do something better with the time, she said, than waste it in asking riddles that have no answers. Take some more tea, the March Hare said to Alice very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, said Alice, replied in an offended tone so I can't take more. I mean you can't take less, said the Hatter. It's easy to take more than nothing. At this, Alice got up and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going, although she looked back once or twice. The last time she saw them, they were trying to put the Dormouse into the teapot. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice, as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party I ever was at in all my life. And just as she said this, she noticed that one of the trees had a door leading right into it. That's very curious, she thought. I think I may as well go in at once. And in she went. Once more, she found herself in the long hall and close to the little glass table. Taking the little golden key, she unlocked the door that led into the garden. Then she set to work nibbling at the mushroom. She kept a piece in her pocket till she was just about a foot high. And then she walked down the little passage and then she found herself at last in the beautiful garden among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains. Chapter eight, the Queen's Croquet Ground. A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses growing on it were white but there were three gardeners at it, busily painting them red. Suddenly their eyes chanced to fall upon Alice as she stood watching them. <clears throat> Would you tell me, please, said Alice a little timidly, why are you painting those roses? Five and seven said nothing but looked at two. Two began in a low voice. <clears throat> why, the fact is, you see, oh, miss, this here ought to have been a red rose tree, and we put a white one in by mistake. And if the queen was to find out, we should all have our heads cut off, you know. So you see, miss, we're doing our best before she comes to... And at this moment, five, who had been anxiously looking across the garden, called out, The queen! The queen! And the three gardeners instantly threw themselves flat on their faces, and there was a sound of many footsteps, and Alice looked round, eager to see the queen. First came ten soldiers carrying clubs with their hands and feet at the corners. Next, the ten cur couriers there were ornamented all over with diamonds. After these came the royal children. There were ten of them, all ornamented with hearts. Next came the guests, 
mostly kings and queens, and among them Alice recognized the white rabbit. Then followed the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion, and last of all this grand procession came the king and the queen of hearts. When the procession came opposite to Alice, they stopped and looked at her, and the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. My name is Alice, so please your majesty, said Alice very politely, but added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards, after all. <clears throat> Can you play croquet? shouted the queen. The question was meant evidently for Alice. Yes, said Alice loudly. Well, come on then, roared the queen. It's, it's a very fine day, in a timid voice to Alice. She was walking along by the white rabbit, who was peeping anxiously into her face. Very, said Alice. Where's the duchess? Hush, hush, said the rabbit. She's under sentence of execution. What for? said Alice. She boxed the queen's ears, the rabbit began. Get to your places, shouted the queen in a voice of thunder, and the people began running about in all directions, tumbling up against each other. However, they got settled down in a minute or two, and the game began. Alice thought she had never seen such curious croquet ground in all her life. It was all ridges and furrows. The croquet balls were live hedgehogs, and the mallets like flamingos, and the soldiers had to double themselves and stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. The players all played at once, without waiting for turns, quarreling all the while and fighting for the hedgehogs, and in a very short time, the queen was in a furious passion and went stamping about and shouting, Off with his head! or Off with her head! at about once a minute. Oh, they're dreadfully fond of beheading people here, thought Alice. The great wonder is that there's anyone left alive. She was looking about for a way to escape when she noticed the curious appearance in the air. Oh, it's the Cheshire Cat, she said to herself. Now I shall have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on, said the cat. Well, I don't think they play at all fairly, Alice said in a rather complaining tone. And they all quarrel so dreadfully one can't hear himself speak and they don't seem to have any rules in particular. How do you like the queen? said the cat in a low voice. Not at all, said Alice. Alice thought she might as well go back and see how the game was going on, so she went off in search of her hedgehog. The hedgehog was engaged in a fight with another hedgehog, which seemed to Alice an excellent opportunity for croqueting one of them with the other. The only difficulty was that her flamingo was gone across to the other side of the garden where Alice could see it trying, in a helpless sort of way, to fly up into a tree. She caught the flamingo and tucked it away under her arm that it might not escape again. Just then Alice ran across the Duchess, who was now out of prison. She tucked her arm affectionately into Alice's and they walked off together. Alice was very glad to find her in such a pleasant temper. She was a little startled, however, when she heard the voice of the Duchess close to her ear. You're thinking about something, my dear, and that makes you forget to talk. <clears throat> the game is going on better, rather better now, Alice said, by way of keeping up the conversation a little. Tis so, said the Duchess, and the moral of that is, oh, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. <clears throat> Somebody said, Alice whispered, that it's done by everybody minding his own business. Ah, oh, well, it means much the same thing, said the Duchess, digging her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder, as she added. And the moral of that is, take care of the sense and the sounds that will care for themselves. To Alice's great surprise, the Duchess's arm that was linked into hers began to tremble. Alice looked up, and there stood the Queen right in front of them, with her arms folded, frowning like a thunderstorm. Now I give you fair warning, shouted the queen, stamping on the ground as she spoke. Either you or your head must be off, and that in about half no time. Take your choice. And the duchess took her choice and was gone in a moment. Let's go on with the game, the queen.
queen, said Alice, and Alice was too much frightened to say a word, but slowly followed her back to the croquet ground. All the time they were playing, the queen never left off quarreling with the other players and shouting, off with his head, or off with her head. And by the end of half an hour or so, all the players, except the king, the queen, and Alice, were in the custody of the soldiers under sentence of execution. And then the queen left off quite out of breath and walked away with Alice. Alice heard the king say in a low voice to the company generally, you're all pardoned. And suddenly the cry, the trial's beginning, was heard in the distance and Alice ran along with the others. Chapter nine. Who stole the tarts? The king and queen of hearts were seated on their throne when they arrived and a great crowd assembled about them. All sorts of little birds and beasts as well as a whole pack of cards. The knave was standing before them in chains with a soldier on each side to guard him. And near the king was the white rabbit with a trumpet in one hand and a scroll of parchment in the other. In the very middle of the court was a table with a large dish of tarts upon it. Oh, I wish they'd get the trial done, Alice thought, and hand around the refreshments. Now the judge, by the way, was the king, and he wore his crown over his great wig. Ah, that's the jury box, thought Alice. And those twelve creatures? Some were animals and some were birds. I suppose they are the jurors. Just then the white rabbit called out, Silence in the court! Harold, read the accusation, said the king. And on this, the white rabbit blew three blasts on the trumpet, then unrolled the parchment scroll and read as follows. The queen of hearts, she made some tarts all on a summer's day. The knave of hearts, he stole those tarts and took them quite away. Call the first witness, said the king. And the white rabbit blew three blasts on the trumpet and called out, first witness. The first witness was the hatter. He came in with a teacup in one hand and a piece of bread and butter in the other. You ought to have finished, said the king. When did you begin? And the hatter looked at the March Hare, who had followed him into the court arm in arm with the Dormouse. Fourteenth mm -hmm. of March, I think it was, he said. Give your evidence, said the king, and don't be nervous or I'll have you executed on the spot. This did not seem to encourage the witness at all. He kept shifting from one foot to the other, looking uneasily at the queen, and in his confusion, he bit a large piece out of his teacup instead of the bread and butter. Just at this moment, Alice felt a very curious sensation. She was beginning to grow larger again. The miserable hatter dropped his teacup and bread and butter and went down on one knee. I'm a poor man, your majesty, he began. Mm, you're a very poor speaker, said the king. You may go, said the king, and the hatter hurriedly left the court. Call the next witness, said the king. The next witness was the duchess's cook. She carried the pepper box in her hand, and the people near the door began sneezing all at once. Give your evidence, said the king. Shan't, said the cook. The king looked anxiously at the white rabbit, who said in a low voice, Your majesty must cross-examine this witness. Oh, well, if I must, I must, said the king. What are tarts made of? Pepper, mostly, said the cook. And for some minutes, the whole court was in confusion. By the time they had settled down again, the cook had disappeared. Never mind, said the king. Call the next witness. And Alice watched the white rabbit as he fumbled over his list. And imagine her surprise when he called out at the top of his shrill little voice, the name Alice. That is the end of chapter nine. We will follow up in chapter 10 with Alice's evidence the next time we meet together on Library at Home. Thanks for joining us. This is Miss Carolyn from the Town Hall Library.